The advent of awareness. There was certainly keen noticing before history, or history would not have been conceived. But during those centuries before written records, even cave paintings, all former noticing seems to have disappeared from us, but has it. There's a tremendous invisible contribution to how we perceive. An unimaginably long discovery process of vanished souls who spoke, sung, and experimented with what it was, is, to be aware, whom we now take for granted, as we often do with our own awareness. Thousands of centuries of experimentation, failures, dead ends, and remarkable but unrecorded revelations allow us, if we choose, to awaken fully to the gift of our own perception. Noticing did arise from nowhere, so too the birth of consciousness. But once it began to migrate, perhaps inspired by the melody of birds, for what the primeval ancients heard certainly stirred their imaginations, with the glimmerings of kindred animals who communicate for survival and at times for pure delight. Existence originated its greatest paradox. Let us muse on beginnings. First, it has been newly discovered that cave paintings release stencils primarily handprints and read on cave walls in what is now Spain, were most likely applied nearly 40,000 years ago by Neanderthals. This remarkable find, based on improved dating techniques, reveals that consciousness is not exclusive to our species, nor is art. Representational mirroring was originally sacred and filled both artist and viewer with awe. To make an image of what Benjamin called ritual art, wherein the aura of uniqueness evoked the origins and mystery of consciousness. The experience was saturated with spiritual significance, as any religious rite or belief ritualized or codified into later orthodoxies, with what we may still consider the origin of authentic art. To mirror with an image was sacred, and it still is, if we consider what it reflects. The original miracle, the miracle of awareness, so often alienated and ignored, allows all things and subjects to be and to become. For without our noticing it, without our noticing, it is impossibly hypothetical to maintain we, indeed the universe, exists without someone, even if it be a Neanderthal, to notice it. The image may be worshipped, but it is the making, poiesis, which is sacred, the process by which we create that mirrors the origin of our creation. Consciousness could not exist without language. Consciousness begins with, or I experiment, so I experimentally maintain, a gap between one thing or subject indicated and assigned represented, be it image, note, or word. Again, one thing or subject is indicated by a sign, but to cross the space from sign to referent requires an invisible presence, or rather, presencing because all is in time and a becoming. To ask why the eyes of awareness open may reveal why and how we perceive now, as our origins reveal our originality. All things, worlds, dreams, souls, life, 
appears, flourishes, fades, and disappears, only because at least one consciousness notices. It is everything and absolutely nothing. Pure appearance. The only thing that is not a thing, yet, from it we all existence appears. If consciousness begins when a space between a sign and a referent is traversed, the invisible present thing, our becoming, discloses the riddle, the sphinx, the mystery of our being here and our being aware. If we consider the signs, both our origins and outcomes suddenly change by how the space is filled, how we experience and why we create. Speculative need not mean idle here. We ponder to pursue, to engage, our being in time once on earth. Though we may infer a long struggle and composite prehistory, consciousness did develop in seeming isolation on Earth, but why? If, as the anthropic theory of the universe maintains, featured at the end of Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, the universe is here to be noticed. All biologic life rises and struggles not simply to survive, but to be aware. We are witnesses not only to ourselves, but what the pre-Socratic Anaxagoras called the all. And this would comprise our sole purpose. The rest is freedom. For if consciousness is coextensive with language, one sound, character, hieroglyph, cipher, ideogram, etc., or image, stands for something else, an elephant's trumpet to signal danger, a dolphin's whistle, or is it click or chirp for delight, etc. Tree will indicate a tree in any language. Then we may have been lifted by, stood up into consciousness. And all of evolution culminates in awareness. Presented all cosmologies, one would guess an infinite and eternal universe. Boundaries seem impossible. In On the Nature of Things, Lucretius maintains it logically impossible for the universe to have a boundary. He argues that if one threw a javelin at the boundary or edge of the universe and it bounced back, that implies another side or surface, then another necessary to support it, then another to support it ad infinitum. We're now told that javelin might instantly appear on the far side of the universe. We're also told the universe exploded out of nothing into existence, or that this beginning is rounded, so that we cannot say it has an end or beginning in time, and it is incredible. So too, the advent of awareness. But with consciousness, we have direct evidence every moment we perceive. The millions of years since our first awakenings quietly echo the time a human needs to rise into adulthood. An essential difference between humans and apes is the length of a childhood. We are still considered young into our early 30s. Much of our lifetimes we aspire to understand the complexities of human experience, or we never stop, for our understanding will forever be incomplete. The point of life Maybe never to stop wondering, expanding outwardly and inwardly, one's noticing with awe. Just as incredible, we seem to lose awareness when our bodies expire. If our bodies disconnect our minds, and we utterly vanish, and remember nothing, our every moment is incredible. If we muse on this momentarily, and it instantly evaporates, this modest insight reveals everything. Regard your friend or beloved laughing, reading, or a stranger in the street. If this can be even temporarily fathomed, we return to the brevity of our gift, perhaps to affirm our temporal horizon and how we live this paradox. Since we cannot hear the first languages spoken, nor our remote ancestors' music, and rarely see their art, we might consider awareness began 
with the image, with, say, painting on cave walls. They also painted themselves, as in the indigenous still do. An image may represent a hand, a hunter, or a bison, yet it is not a hand, hunter, or bison. The creation of the image was saturated with awe, not to worship the image, though we can guess that superstition began immediately with the, mistaking the image for an idol that captures or owns a living subject. Just as now, we take the technologic product or commodity and the fetishism of capitalist reproduction, an object of obsession for summing up or owning reality. But between the image and what it represents, say, fire, this invisible space traversed allows us to notice, to reflect back to our origins and to our future, celebrating that we can perceive, that we can see. How long have we regarded flame and fire? We marveled into flame as children, saw minute blues and trembling greens giving birth to yellows and reds, traced the wavering climb and shiver of heat, rise to whips and feathers, wisps and arrow points that strided off into air. And of the discovery of fire, it is, it was ever in every creature's perception, fear, dreams, and wonder. We began to start it ourselves, to carry it and conjure it, to protect, cook, clean, to light primordial darknesses as the faces of our friends, lovers, as our children in a brief circle of life could still see stars above the smoke. It is also the story of radiance within our dreams, the light within our souls, the warmth felt in love and couleur to counter betrayal, the rays at dawn's edge, the great fire of our sun, a true illumining of a sudden kindness to forgive the world and fate, the enigma that our light will end. We carry that fire in our mind's eye, the magic of a changing insubstantial power, like consciousness. As it played on cave walls and gazelles fled, or stood ground staring in defiance of hunters deep into our early eyes, directly as pure image, which we recorded as real. Like faces and animals we imagine in cloud cathedrals above green forests or blonde sand, against the blue of an ancient sky, the leap from real to image and back, bridges, colors, the scene and invisibilities of our imagination. If we do not look away, we dazzle ourselves into hallucination. The evidence that we can see and reflect, reflect remains unchanged. Fire lit the wall inside the cave. Might this explain why Plato's cave allegory is so archetypal? Reflecting our place among objects and each other as we spread across the earth to make a world. The imminently spiritual appeared with spirit worlds and images, which now reflected back to us, luring us up with an incredibly long effort from the blind materiality of instinct. The unconscious also must have made the transition from the organic unaware, pure instinct, to partial awareness. As we rose from the remain animals, the first glimmerings of unconscious noticing must have risen from the image within a dream, and later sound as image, as a positional text, drifting away from the necessity of instinct. Just above, the instinctual, the image without mooring appears. It was not yet symbolic or anything but a reflection, a secondary negation, to reclaim or recapture, to own the exterior world. Once it demores, separates, however, the immediate context is lost, and so too its biologic causation. In this distancing, we are exiled with an attendant nostalgia for that first determinism, the home of unawareness that haunts our every intention. Yet as we carry the image of that flame to apply it, to illumine our awareness in any way we please, we rise into freedom. Initially coextensive with the body in our past, 
and the unconscious mind must have grown with the conscious mind. Animist tribes identify man or woman with a bush soul, or a projection of the unconscious onto a tree, animal, a river, hopefully without devaluing the conscious mind. Note Native American mythology, or Shintoism in Japan. We live in harmony with nature again, but we mask our consciousness with an anthropomorphic vestige, the persona mask of an unalienated unconscious reconciled with our consciousness, as Jung called individuation, a non-dual relation to ourselves. We can still feel the excitement as it startled the far ancients, the flame flickering over shadow on a cave wall, the fire dances to transport the reconciliation of seen and unseen into space. This freedom, with the imminent sacred in an Eliadian time vortex of movement, in a ritual wherein mortal bodies became art, works of art and space as dance, celebrates our freedom to create now. Merleau-Ponty, in his lectures, Consciousness and the Acquisition of Language, culminates a highly technical discussion of linguistics, phonetics, Piagetian cognitives, childhood psychology, to write. The initial form of language, therefore, would have been a kind of song. Men would have sung their feelings before communicating their thought. Just as writing was at first painting, language at first would have been song, which, if it analyzed itself, would have become a linguistic sign. It is through the existence or the exercise of this song that men would have tried out their power of expression. Could music have birthed consciousness? Was it ontologically and historically prior to image or world, word? Rather? Babies, prior to language and words, respond to the simplest repeated intervals if one whistles, hums, or sings to them. They brighten to hear any repeated melodic phrase. We need not press the analogy that babies echo the evolution of all awareness after their first exposure to air as an evolutionary cameo repeat, but it does resonate. A note is a sign, but is far less abstract than a visual mark or a spoken word. Yet, what does music refer to? If not programmatic, when melodies imitate natural sounds, as opposed to absolute music, music is free of all imitation. Music stands for nothing but the imagination's freedom. Music, like mind, is an invisible art. It is the only art which animals seemingly without consciousness practice and they sometimes seem to enjoy our music. We may assume there was melody before human consciousness, for there is certainly melody amongst birds now, and there's no evidence they learned it from us. If we remove the flying reptile pterodactyl screeches and the wretched cause of blackbirds from the oral canvas of the primeval sky, <laughs> Sorry. it may be that our <laughs> it may be that our awareness rose from the space between bursts and melody inspired by birds. The invisible presencing that fills that space with nothing, births everything, opens as did our mouths for something other than eating or sucking, to sing. And this may have been the birth of language, with singing first, then speaking, and poetry before prose, just as Vico would have it, in his charming Nueva Ciencia, or New Science. Music is weightless, like space, light, and time, transparent like mind. Music incarnates freedom through our bodies with dance to lighten us, and to freshen language, lest it decay into monotonic utility. We play with time before we lose it to grace our earth with a symbol of our mortal eternity. We paint an image freely from the light of our courage to be kind, not just to kin, but to all who notice. Might this uncover the origins of democracy? Please bear with me as I quote from last year's speech here, the kaleidoscope of simultaneity. 
Noticing is a great democratic experiment to which governments or small egalitarian communities, even lovers, aspire. Noticing, not ideology, religion, nor the nation state, is our greatest community. Kant mentioned a census communis, or an invisible community, of everyone who has taste, if they judge something beautiful, if not reflecting a private self-interest. But why limit this community to taste and the beautiful, or to aesthetic experience? Awareness is our first community. Everything that has, does, or will ever happen presupposes someone is aware, someone notices. From the advent of awareness, from our long rise up and into consciousness, from researches in every art and science, from the most intimate individual experiences, what is happening reveals what is noticed. How could this dilation of song lend itself to any political experience but democracy? Before politics, there is the human soul. The word probably came last, but it is the greatest triumph in part because it is the most abstract. In this moment, Hegel is partially right. The progress of our spirit, or community of noticing, our actual and first democracy, as Weltgeist or world spirit, frees itself completely into full awareness. The word is transportable, malleable, and lends itself to time and consciousness as reflection on the past and to anticipate the future, to planning, essential to agriculture. But abstraction is also the beginning of tragedy. Losing the concrete, and this is where I've always thought Hegel is tricking us, by confusing, equating the abstract with the concrete when it comes to consciousness, or what he calls the absolute. the full separation can divorce into a new idolatry of what represents consciousness directly to what negates it. The word with image and music creates a world. Together they pull us up into consciousness. We wake up. Yet, it's our, yet our greatest invention can also lend itself to a reified betrayal of the origins of our consciousness and awe. It begins what Lao Tzu calls our loss of Tao, distracted by the 10,000 things. And it's key now to how an object economy coalesces image, music, and word into fabricated commercials. Products abstracted from exploiting and potentially destroying human beings. All respect for the word. But when words mean nothing, divorced in the context of their reference, for those who use them to capture money in an ephemeral economy, Awareness as image, music, and language can be synthesized, split off, alienated, to implant something like a virus into the most wonderful thing, which is not a thing, to parasite consciousness with illusion. Everything dies beneath the invisible sun of illusion. If painting preceded the word, and music preceded words as sound, Consciousness owes not only its existence, but its resistance to art. And this makes art far more fundamental than economics, Marx's theology of the worldly God, which seems absurd to those who reduce experience to a pre-given bottom line. The revolt against the enslavement of our senses not, and ourselves means to live beyond the reach of chiefs, kings, sultans, pharaohs, Caesars, czars, and states. And now the global marketplace, which is no place at all but omniscient, to reclaim freedom through art. Consciousness has probably changed very little. If one still wonders or risks soul dilation before others in a contracted and falsely objectified world, one needs resist the technology of image replication, which can intercede between sign and reference. Replace unique consciousness, slipping a two-way mirror into our awareness in which we see only ourselves in isolation or nothing at all but a synthetically packaged illusion 
to slip in a self-replicating memory plug which can dominate the life of one's mind to exploit it for money, to deflect the intention while amplifying the interests of the producer, the object, is to represent nothing but itself as something other than what it is. Technology is deemed neutral to disclaim the intention behind it. We pay for this false objectivity. We buy replicated objects and images of objects to mask our mortality. Our fears are virtually repackaged to promote economic dependence. We accept object information communication viruses, another interpretation of Camus's plague, establishing an I-it relation, Martin Luther, within our bodies, within our, Martin Luther, within our own bodies, until we encounter I-thou individuals and artists who express an act of gratitude that we can perceive. To protest this alienation does not mean we must do so explicitly. Then a pre-given ethics and eventual self-righteousness of politics will predetermine and so replace art. But to evoke the origins of consciousness through metaphor and ideational creativity is to rebirth full individuality. To engage the struggle to honor awareness from the world's dawn means to revolt in spite of evident object slavery in behalf of a modest but inalienable freedom to create. Awareness adds an incredible power to survival. One can plan, one can make, use tools, construct. But one can also reflect on origins, mentally travel to the root of consciousness, to the inset flame of novelty. One may hear again one's true voice rise like a still flame, to hear what Heidegger termed the call of the self to the self. In independence and dilation of the soul, we return to the human community of all noticing, to awareness as our first community. Born to existence to serve no master, we each open a small frontier of time. Yet behind us, millions of years of building, as well as breaking down and a kind of lateral development of our awareness, ever changing from moment to moment, echoes and rises. When we take for granted that we can perceive, the expansion of awareness ends in the object dominating the subject who sees it. When we remain grateful, we freshen perception and perspective to resist the reduction of markets and the private pursuit of money to dominate and atomize the all. We can still reflect the same intense excitement as the flickering of flame and shadow on a cave wall amazed the far ancients when the aura of magic representation captures light on clay, when fire dances transport so as to open a space within our time for a community of awareness on earth. For every life begins the course of awareness anew. The present is unique. It ever evaporates, yet is ever here. It is wholly intangible, but our only existence. We could stop time to make it real, but then we kill it. We recreate the past and envision the future to gather unto our elusive present more, whereas we slip through time, it seems more inadequate. But the very inadequacy is our mortal paradox. We can neither stop time nor understand it. But the enigma is our life. Feeling this, flowers, short-lived butterflies and moths, or an echo of laughter from the hall, or the briefest of kisses no longer seem quite so decorative. Even the oldest people we see or hear of are not really old, nor the young so young, and even babies are aging. It's always getting away from us, this both fully embodied yet absolutely uncanny real time in which we live until we die. Given our brief time on Earth, the small universe within our heads is all we have. How to honor this gift? 
With nothing to preordain our path, we still need an identity deeper than the name to which we respond. There is no rehearsal, except perhaps to ponder the efficacy of our choices, or ready ourselves for crisis, no smoke signals or skywriting. We are each a freedom to invent why we are here, and to make our survival worthy of our effort to understand it. To grow wise, we must experiment, as each individual choice we make may modestly add to human awareness. As the Earth circles our sun in space, beneath the fluff of swirling cloud well below here, we are all an aspiration differently conceived. It is not each other we wish to own, but to celebrate since time's creation, our being able to notice. For every comet tale of doubt, to each solar law, before the enigma we name future. We're all looking for a new way to imagine. The growth of awareness will never be captured as history, but it can be symbolized. The expansion, like the universe, is exponential. But as a leaf of grass or grain of sand and the red sten or the red stenciled hand in a primeval cave, we paint an image on an empty wall fill the air with song, or script our mortal truths over white pages of time. From our present, we light a candle flame to the invisible dead. Our works leave but a brief mirror of a fading vision wedged in sand. We've no map, but a moving chart of a fate not yet writ. Yet it is our aspiration to represent the all through art, or it's as if we send a modest kite aloft to honor the transparencies of all who have or will ever perceive. For as long as another eye opens to dawn, it is ever the advent of our awareness. <laughs>